Um, my name is Anand. Um, thank you for coming to my talk. Um, the topic of discussion today is living off the land. I work for a company called MNP, and I get a lot of questions about what MNP actually stands for. It took me a year to actually learn what MNP stands for, but I decided to put this uh, slide about what it actually means. So MNP stands for Meyer, Norris, and Penny. These are the uh, founding members of MNP. And I decided to put this picture in to give you more perspective on what MNP is. Um, if you are a baseball fan, um, you can see this uh, MNP logo in the uh, Blue Jays Stadium. So there you go. All right. Um, so as I said, I work as a senior consultant. Um, my day-to-day -day job involves doing risk assessments. I'm also a PCI USA, so I do a lot of PCI assessments. I also do pen testing, um, but it has been more than 16 months since I've done my last pen test. The reason being, I decided to get more focused on the PCI world, and I picked up a lot of big projects, so the last 16 months have been purely PCI and risk assessments. I also like to read, travel, watch documentaries, and I'm also an amateur malware analyst. So, amateur, right? But don't try to discuss like high level stuff with me. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so the agenda for today is I'm going to talk more about what living off the land actually means. Then we are going to discuss few categories which are within the living off the land topic. Each of these categories has a demo. Um, now I know that uh, demos usually fail when you're doing in front of the crowd. So, <laughs> so for the presentation, I decided to actually make some videos. Um, so all the demos are in form of videos. Um, so yeah, all right, that's good. All right, um, after which I'll open the floor for uh, Q&A. So what actually living off the land means? So this term has been coined in the infosec industry in the last, I would say, five plus years. But it basically means when a attacker used the uh, system tools or inbuilt, inbuilt system functionality to, uh, to carry out malicious act. Why do they want to do it? Well, there are a couple of main reasons. If they are using system tool and system functionality to carry out the malicious act, Attribution is really hot. Secondly, there is no risk of being detected by antivirus system because all the system tools are actually good. Uh, there is another reason, and I did not put that in the slide, but writing your own malware is um, quite tedious. So they would like to use whatever is on the system to carry out uh, their malicious activity. So. Um, Living off the land topic, there are four main categories which I want to discuss today. Uh, the first one is the non-portable executable file attacks, and we're going to talk more detail about that. Dual use tools, file less attacks, and file less persistence. Yeah, one thing uh, that is not in the slides, this talk is 100% focused on Windows environment, so I won't be talking about Linux. So, sorry Linux fans. But that's a good thing, right? All right, uh, so non-portable executable type of file of um, attacks. Uh, so back in April 2018, Checkpoint discovered that you can um, play around with the headers of a PDF file, uh, which can allow you to extract the uh, NTLM hashes from a system. We're gonna see more of that in the demo, and I'm gonna discuss that more in detail. Uh, the second kind of non pe attacks will be email attachments. Um, hackers have been sending email attachments with zip files which contains uh, file types such as link, SCT, and HTA, which are known to, um, um, to have the ability to um, do malicious stuff. And the third one is our old friend Microsoft document with my macros. Um, how many people know what macros are? Perfect, awesome. So I don't have to explain to you what macros are. Uh, but still, you would not believe, I used to think that if you train your user not to enable the macros, the problem would be solved. Okay. Yeah, but, but, but I've seen a lot of places, especially the finance departments, which haven't used macros and they have been taught to just enable macros. 
a lot of them have their um, I don't know what financial formulas been built into Excel sheets. So they open up the Excel, Microsoft tells them not to enable macros, but they are being trained to enable macros, so there you go. Uh, I decided to include a, a Trojan which was discovered last year. It's known as PPT Dropper. I haven't played with it, but I thought it would be interesting to include it over here in case you guys get interested. Um, this, uh, so the concept behind that is that if you actually hover on a text, it can actually execute um, the macro. So you really don't have to do anything special to execute the macro, you just hover on it and the macro get executed. Um, other convincing ways of having the user execute the macro is to include something like this. This is a protected document, so double click on this to unlock the good stuff which is contained in the document. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, for the demo, we're going to discuss the, um, the, um, the vulnerability, you can say, with Checkpoint discovered back in 2018. So PDF file have this, I um, um, forgot the term, but the um, metadata. So they have a tag within the metadata, which is the uh, F tab, where you can actually, if you put the attacker SMB server and a dummy file, when you open the PDF, your PDF reader will actually try to get that file from the SMB server. And if you don't know, when you try to get a resource from the SMB server, Microsoft is programmed to send your username and your hash credential to the SMB server. So, um, so yeah, um, I haven't read uh, the latest on this, but I think Checkpoint reached out to Microsoft about this, but. Apparently, this is not a vulnerability because this is a functionality. So, uh, the best defense against this is to actually block any traffic leaving for port 445 from your network. Uh, that's the best defense. Um, so, yeah, for demo, I actually use Responder to mimic as an SMB server. How many people know what Responder is? Okay. So Responder is a tool uh, which comes with, uh, uh, Kali Linux has Responder installed by default, uh, but we have found that the one installed in, in Kali Linux, it's not that good, so it's better if you actually pull down the code from GitHub and then run the Responder from there. Uh, so for the demo, that's what I did. Um, so I made video scars, so I just minimized this and Okay. All right, let me search PDF. There we go. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so for the demo, uh, my uh, Kali Linux box, which is the attacker, is named Sputnik. How many people know what Sputnik is? Awesome. For people who don't know, that was the first man-made satellite launched into orbit by Russia. Dot coming south. Watch. <laughs> <laughs> it was a Soviet. The Soviet. <laughs> Uh, uh, for some reason, I'm actually fascinated by Russian hackers. So, um, yeah. All right. So, um, on Sputnik, um, um, so what I did is, uh, when this vulnerability came out, uh, two of the engineers, they actually wrote a, uh, a uh, Python script, which takes a, uh, which takes a PDF and can actually um, change the headers in that PDF to include your SMB server, which is under your control. So that's what I'm doing over here. I'm running that script, which is known as Verse PDF. Uh, and if somebody need more information on that, where they can get that script, uh, come talk to me after, after this talk. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I have a file named pdf.pdf, which is a PDF file. And I'm supplying the SMB server IP address. So it's going to take that file put my SMB server in the header, and the file will be ready to be sent to, to the victim. 
So there we go. So I'm running Responder here. Uh, so that's Responder. So as you can see, it's listening on port 4, four uh, not port 45, but it's acting as the um, the LN. Well, it, ha it has all these things enabled, but we are only interested for it to act as an SMB server. <coughs> my voice. All right. So uh, this is our um, victim. So he's going to go fetch the PDF. It's actually nice when you are the victim and the attacker. <laughs> so, sorry for the cheesy videos, but I have to enable my HTTP server to fetch the PDF. All right, so here's our PDF. And now I'm going to go and open that PDF. And hopefully, there you go. So there you go, simple as that. So you are able to actually get the, um, the username and the hash. Um, and we all know that there are tools available now which can break the hash pretty easily. Uh, and users are known to not pick a very strong password. Good? Sorry about the cheesy videos, it was my first presentation, so. Yeah. Perfect. All right, uh, any questions? Yes, sir. So, in order to be successful, what do you need? You need the internal IP address. So, the SMB server, that should be your SMB server, but you should be controlling it. Yeah. And then you sh you need to send this PDF to the victim, and he needs to. Oh, is that me or is that me? No, that's sorry. Okay. Uh, and he needs to open that PDF. Okay. So, one thing I want to add here is when I tried to open the PDF in Chrome, it wasn't working for me. And I think Chrome actually prevents um, uh, that behavior to happen. I did not do more research why that's happening, but Chrome never allowed me to, um, to do that. Any other questions? So which, which port does your uh, information come back over which port? 445? Port 445, yes. So that was, okay. Yeah. So um, I would actually like to add to that, so you can block the outgoing traffic on port 445. Also, there is a setting within the registry which actually prevents uh, uh, which actually prevents that sort of behavior. I don't have much more detail on that, but I was reading about it like a couple of days ago. But somebody mentioned that you can actually uh, modify the registry value, and that prevents this kind of behavior. Yes, sir. Is there any uh, uh, utility that's a header checker? actually read the header itself? Like, you know, the header of the PDF? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I personally don't know. But yes. Yes, sir. So you're just getting the user credentials, no access to the user? No, yes, you're right. You just get the NTLM hash and the uh, username. So you still have to run that through your password cracker. Is it an MD5? No, it's the uh, Windows hash NTLM version 2. Any other question? Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> Come on, this is my first talk. So for NTLM, um, my understanding of that is correct. Don't they break the password into like two separate hashes to make it easier? Yes. Correct? Yeah. Is that still for version 2 as well? Yep. Yeah. You're getting the whole thing. Any other question? <laughs> I'm saying NTLM, but yeah, it's NTLM version 2, so you're getting everything, the whole shebang. Okay? No. Okay. So there's my presentation. Alrighty. Um, so, So this is the second category of um, living off the land, which is the use of dual use tools. So I have divided them into different categories and have listed the tools which you can use for the different purposes. For example, for reconnaissance, you can use the net command, which gives you a lot of information about the system. Who am I? System info. 
So the attacker can use this command to do reconnaissance and collect as much information, well, a lot of information about your system. Second one is credential stealing. So how many people know what Mimikatz is? Okay, so Mimikatz is actually a tool which was wrote by uh, Benjamin, <coughs> forget his last name, but uh, dude is based out of France uh, and he does some cool stuff. But he made this tool which if you run on a Windows system, it actually extracts the clear text password from the memory. Yes. Uh, Microsoft has uh, released a, um, a patch. There is a Windows setting which you can uh, enable, like I think there's a flag 01 which you can flip, which will prevent Windows from storing clear text password in the memory. Um, but still, like if you have control of the system, you can easily flip that registry setting back and run Memicat. Uh, Windows Credential Editor is another tool which you can use for credential stealing. I personally haven't played with it, uh, but Mimikatz is awesome. If you try to play with Mimikatz, um, you need to disable, disable your antivirus system because as soon as it sees Mimikatz being downloaded, it's going to remove it. On top of that, if you're using Chrome or even in, well, I haven't seen, I don't use Internet Explorer, but if you try to download that in Chrome, Chrome's going to flag it as a malware and I'm gonna remove it. So you actually have to set Chrome to, I guess, not protect you and I'll allow you to do whatever you want. And that's the only way you can download it. Um, all right, uh, for lateral movement, um, we have different system tools. PSXAC, RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol, PowerShell Remoting, and WMI. I'm gonna talk more about these two, two topics later, but PowerShell Remoting is uh, becoming huge when you want to do lateral movement. Uh, PSExec used to be a choice for pen testers, uh, but lately uh, not, not a lot of people are using it because a lot of antivirus are picking it up and blocking it. So people are switching to PowerShell remoting. Uh, for persistence, um, there are a few methods that you can use. I'm going to talk about WMI for persistence. Well, don't worry, I'm going to actually explain what WMI is. Um, but you can also use the group policy object and schedule tasks. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what schedule tasks are. Uh, before I do, how many people actually know what schedule tasks are? Perfect. That's awesome. So as you all know, Windows does provide you with the functionality that you can have scheduled tasks on your system. <laughs> So over here, for example, I'm making a scheduled task uh, which runs the, uh, the calculator EXE. Um, pretty much everybody uses that uh, for proof of concept. Um, so over here, I'm running it at uh, 6.53. Yeah, I think that was a couple of days ago when I was working on it. But yeah. Um, so why am I talking about scheduled task? Uh, scheduled tasks have been used by a lot of recent malwares uh, as part of the whole process of um, infecting the system. For example, APT32. How many people know what APT32 is? No? Okay. So APT32 is uh, one of the um, Russian groups, um, which is... Uh, responsible for a lot of hacks, uh, including the DNC, the uh, Ukrainian uh, power grid failure. So FireEye has done a lot of research on APT32, and this screen cap actually comes from FireEye blog. So over here you can see that the malware is actually using uh, the scheduled task to pull a DLL. Um, well, they have hidden the DLL in a uh, JPEG file, but it's actually a DLL. And yeah, so that's why I wanted to talk about it. Um, another example with Fin7 Group. Fin7 Group is a financially motivated group, and it's targeting a lot of financial institutions. And they have also been known to use scheduled tasks as part of their whole process to infect your system. Uh, again, this directly comes from the FireEye uh, blog. Um, and as you can see over here, uh, they are scheduling a task to run at a certain time. 
um, to run this uh, VBS script, which contains their contains their bad code or their malicious code. Um, does anybody work for uh, FireEye? No. Okay. Um, I keep an eye on their blog because there is some very cool stuff that comes out of this blog. Uh, they have a blog up every week and they generally discuss a malware or something every week. Uh, this week I think they released a blog on uh, miners. Um, I still haven't read it, but uh, I, I think it's got pretty cool. Um, so I put a demo for this, although I did not feel like it, but I was like, maybe I should. Um, just to prove that scheduled task actually work, and I did not just made it up. So. Pretty simple. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to run the calculator. I'm going to show you that actually calculator runs. Again, I did not want to do this, but I just decided maybe I should so that you guys don't think I'm a fake. <laughs> but we have to wait for a minute or so. Um, okay, so the scheduled task was created successfully. Um, just wait for it for a minute. What, no music? Sorry, no elevator music while we're waiting? I can look uh, at 13 seconds. It's going to come up. Come on. Oh my god. We want action. There you go. <laughs> So it runs. Never mind. Okay, uh, before we move on to the next category, anybody has a question? Yes, sir. Uh, under what circumstances do you want to run a sharing task to do something malicious rather than doing it immediately? If you can run the command that uh, creates a scheduled task, you yeah. obviously can do the same privilege to do whatever, whatever you want. So what's the rationale to run it at a later time? Yeah. Um, so um, you're right, you're absolutely right. But think about if you are just sitting there and just want to collect system information or just want to collect their emails at the end of the day and send it to the uh, remote server, your remote server. So you can actually create a scheduled task which runs at 8 p.m. every night. Take a dump of all the emails and send it to your server and then you can analyze um, offline. Yeah, you can, yeah, exactly. Yes, sir. So it is a good thing to turn off your computer uh, when you leave. <laughs> uh, well, hopefully you're not infected, but um, yeah, sure. <laughs> Any other question? No? Okay, uh, so the next category that I was going to discuss is in-memory attacks. In-memory attacks became famous back in 2001 when Code Red Worm came out. It was a completely memory-based attack. It has no fingerprint on the hard disk itself. Um, a similar thing happened with SQL Slammer back in 2003. Purely memory-based attack. Uh, why do people want to do it? Uh, because if you have less files on the disk, detection is harder. Uh, and execution happening in memory is very difficult for forensic analysts. Think about it. If somebody actually used or executed something in memory, even if you know, it's going to take you a while to actually get the forensic expert and him analyzing the system. And I think after 12 hours, your memory completely gets refreshed. So that's why people want to run in memory. And also, um, if you don't write any files on the disk, chances are that the antivirus solution is not going to pick it up. So there you go. So 
what is the latest trend when it comes to uh, in-memory attacks? Well, PowerShell comes to over rescue. Um, so I saw the same picture last year in B-Side Ottawa, and that's when I actually decided that I have to learn PowerShell. Um, but yeah, so PowerShell is a framework which is based on, well, PowerShell is a command line tool based on .NET framework. It was formally released on April 25, 2006. Um, Microsoft started shipping it with Windows 7 and Windows 2008. They went ahead and made it open source in August 2016, and there is a cross-platform support for Mac OS, CentOS, and Ubuntu. I have a Mac, but I haven't tried, Power, tried to run PowerShell on it. So um, if you have questions how it will run, I, I can't answer. But um, PowerShell is just amazing. Um, and um, I follow a lot Jeffrey Snower, who uh, is the, who's the founder of PowerShell, and Don Jones, who is the first um, MVP, I guess, for PowerShell. Um, and if you are a system admin, um, Don Jones want to learn, if you don't want to learn PowerShell, he says that you should start learning would you like fries with that. Uh, so it's not me, it's Don Jones uh, who says that. So if you are a system admin, you start from learning PowerShell. All right. Um, so a lot of malware have been using PowerShell lately. Um, one of the reasons, and um, for that is uh, currently there is not a lot of extensive logging that is enabled for PowerShell. They might have changed in the recent versions of Windows 10, but I play a lot with Windows 2016, and PowerShell does not do a lot of logging. I mean, it's pretty much disabled on the system. Um, so one of the reasons is that. Also, PowerShell, it's a system tool. It's one of the favorite tools between, uh, for system admins, so malware can easily blend. Uh, and also, there is no binary involved, so yeah. Um, so here is an example of what a in memory, well, what a PowerShell attack would look like. This is a very typical command that you will see malware after malware um, using to uh, to to run their command using PowerShell. Uh, the encoding is uh, base six sixty four, so it's not that difficult to reverse that. Um, all these flags, if you want to know more about them, they are in the slide. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to go with each of them, but basically what they're doing is they're actually hiding that PowerShell is running. They are not using the current profile being set for the user. They are bypassing the current profile. Um, and also, uh, the Windows is hidden, so people really don't know that PowerShell is running. Uh, and the command is encoded. All right. Um, so uh, for the demo, what I decided to do is uh, I tried, decided to do the in-memory execution of the Mimikatz PowerShell script. So somebody actually took the Mimikatz tool and decided to convert that to a PowerShell script. So that's what I'm going to use to do the demo. Uh, one thing, um, again, I think I mentioned this, uh, mentioned this in the beginning of my talk. Um, Microsoft. Um, so that's a registry value which you can actually use and it won't um, store the password in clear text in the memory. Okay. So um, that's the command that I'm going to actually run. Um, and I'm going to show you how it's going to extract the clear text password from the memory. Basically what's happening in this command is invoke expression is a command line uh, built into PowerShell. Um, you can supply a command in the form of a string to this command line and it executes that within the memory. So there's nothing that's written on the disk. Everything happens in the memory. Um,
Okay. So you will notice my super secure password too in a second. super secure password. Uh, if some of you are thinking that's really secure, it's not because Jamball is my last name. So, <laughs> all right. Um, questions? No questions? <laughs> right? Yes, sir. So the hacker needs to have access on the system. Right? Yes. So this is not somebody executing the command on your system. Everything is contained in a malicious binary, which they give you, and yeah, so it's not somebody typing in command. It's a, it's actually part of the malware. So the core, the core shell come default like disabled as you mentioned. But can I enable some of the command from the core shell? So, I'm sorry. So like core shell sometimes it's disabling some of the functionality. Okay. So not everything is uh, enabled. Yeah. With PowerShell? PowerShell. Uh, do you mean the profiles? Yes. So you can actually pass that profile. So Microsoft actually says that the, um, the profiles that they have, that's not a security measure. So you can easily bypass. So I have the uh, bypass flag, which I use, which overrides any of the profiles that you might have set. Oh, from the PowerShell. Yeah. Yes, sir. But the only effective prevention measure was editing the reg key, right, the D-word? So that the password is not stored in memory? Exactly, yeah. Any other? Yes, sir. Yeah, just a question of implementation. So the command was pretty short, so you downloaded the file from GitHub, right? Yes, yeah, so I'm getting it directly from GitHub. Yeah. Any other? So you really don't even have to download that file. I mean, you can have that within that binary that you have. But just to show you like how things are run, I decided to just put it from uh, GitHub. Any other questions? No? How many people are going to learn PowerShell today? <laughs> oh, well, you can learn it today. Why sweet? Yeah, the days, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Uh, so before I talk about fileless persistence, um, so I decided to learn PowerShell last year, and if you don't know PowerShell, I will highly recommend starting learning it. It's amazing. And you would not believe the kind of things that you can do PowerShell, not even malicious thing. Like even for your day-to-day -day job, you can do a ton of stuff. I do a lot of PCI assessments. Part of my job is to do uh, sampling, where I ask my clients to show me, uh, log into their Windows system or Windows server and pull some information. So if you know PowerShell and if you can write a script, you can pull a ton of stuff uh, by just using one script. So, so it's amazing. All right, um, so we want to talk about fileless persistence. How many people actually know what persistence is? In term, in, okay. So when I say persistence, I mean the hacker has gained access to the system, but he wants to maintain that access. So that's what persistence mean in the InfoSec world. Okay, um, so there are two methods which are, well there are a lot of methods to maintain persistence, but there are two methods which are becoming um, famous, popular. popular, thank you, popular um, to maintain persistence. The first one is Windows Registry and the second one is WMI. I'm going to start talking with Windows Registry. Um, so. Um, if you want to run an executable, how would you do it? You, will, you can actually go to the Windows registry and you can actually give the path of your executable in the run key and when your system starts the next time, it will actually execute that, that file. So as you can see, this is my system. So it's a virtual box. So obviously the virtual box tray is set to be run whenever my system starts. But I also like to have my command line ready when I restart my system. So I created this, um, uh, this key for my uh, um, the cmd.exe. So whenever my system starts, 
it pops up and I'm ready to, to go to work. So, um, malwares were, were actually or still are abusing uh, this functionality to give the path of the executable which they want to execute once your system restarts. Um, however, in 2014, uh, Trojan, uh, how would you pronounce it, Polix? Polix. Whatever. Um, so it was seen that this particular malware, it was actually storing the whole executable, you can say, within the registry itself. It's actually not an executable, but it's, it's actually a script. So it doesn't even have to have this exe somewhere on the system. Everything is within the registry. Um, and here you go. So the malware here is actually um, have the command and everything and even the, uh, the script within the registry. Um, there you go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, nothing is on the disk. Everything is in the registry and everything or, or this thing runs when you actually restart the system. Um, if you are interested to read more about it, um, go to my favorite blog, FireEye. They have a lot of information on this. If you want to try it at home, um, I would recommend start with the um, um, start doing simple stuff, um, and then yeah, then insert anything which you actually generate using Kali Linux. Um, okay. Any questions on this? No. Okay. Good. All right, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about WMI. So WMI stands for uh, Windows Management Instrumentation. Basically, it's a Windows implementation of the, of the common information infrastructure module, uh, which is being um, uh, introduced or created by DMTF which I can't remember right now what it stands for. But basically, they wanted a industry standard, which every appliance or every operating system implements, so that if somebody wants to pull system information, it's easier for them. Like There's a consistent way to actually pull system information. Microsoft implemented that in form of WMI. Um, and WMI is part of Windows system since early um, Windows NT days. Uh, So before I start discussing about what WMI is, I have watered down uh, the discussion a lot because I did not want to get into the nitty gritty of WMI. If I start doing that, we will be here till like 10 at night. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to keep it very high level. If you have any questions or want me to discuss or any questions which goes deep, uh, then obviously do that after the talk. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to keep it at a very high level, high level. So what WMI is, I already talked about that. It actually is a mechanism through which you can pull the information about your Windows operating system. How does Microsoft implement this? It's in the form of classes. So everything on your system is represented by a class. When I say everything, I mean your battery, your hard disk, um, your screen, um, the processes running on your system, the services running on your system. Everything is represented by a class. So if you want to see, for example, what processes are running on my system, you actually query the win32 underscore process class, which returns a list of objects. And each object represents the process running on your system. To make things more clear, um, so here on my system, I'm running a query. Um, basically, the query is nothing but me asking WMI to give me all the objects for win32 underscore process class. And I select it to display the name. So I'm sure all those EXEs are very familiar to you. Nothing is new. So these are all the processes running on my system. Now, the fun part is that you can actually use the same win32 underscore process class to create a process yourself. Why? Because the win32 underscore process class has a method which is known as create process. 
So you create an object, well, you call that method to actually create a process for you. For example, if you want to, if you want to run Chrome, you can actually use this class to run Chrome by using the create process method. Is everything clear? Any questions so far? No? We're good? There is none? Okay. Um, so why am I talking about this? Well, the reason why I'm talking about this is the next concept which I'm going to discuss, which is WMI eventing. So think about this. So we already saw how you can pull the information about all the processes running on your system. What if I can put a watchman on the system which notifies me if it notices a process named Chrome being run on your system? Right? So I want to create a watchman which is constantly watching my system and when it sees a process named Chrome being launched, it actually notifies me and tells me, hey Sunny, there is a process named Chrome which is running on your system now. So WMI provides this functionality in the form of WMI eventing. So you can actually tell WMI what I just told you, that if you see this process being run on your system, notify me. Notification could be anything from the execution of a command, an SMTP notification, an event generation, or an execution of a script. So execution of a command, an execution of a script, that's um, what gets us going. So if I can create an event on the system which actually runs a command, uh, for example, user starting a process on a particular time, or when a um, log on or log off happens, um, I can actually have WMI execute my malicious binary at that time. So that can help me maintain persistence. Any question? I know this is a very deep topic and I tried to do it within five minutes, but any questions so far? It's pretty much object oriented programming. You have classes? Yes, sir. Like uh, keywords here, so I can no, 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 no. You can, you can get because everything. So, for example, you want to need, you want to know what's the path of the executable is. You can query WMI inventory to underscore process class. It will give you that. If you want to know when the install date was, it can give you that. So it has a lot of information about a process. Any other? Yes, sir. Well, it seems like. It's way more powerful than just persistence. If I want to tag a yes. particular user you are right, from a sir. particular department doing certain things, yeah. that's the... Yes, and, and WMI is uh, used by a lot of malware to actually know if the process is being run on a sandbox or not. Because the malware queries WMI and tries to know like if I'm running on a sandbox, and if it is, then it doesn't execute the malicious yeah. thing. Yeah, you're right. WMI is a very powerful concept. Um, and I'm sorry for covering that in like 10 minutes. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, so if you don't have any questions, I'm gonna do a little demo uh, on WMI. So, as I said, WMI is a very um, big topic and there is a lot more involved. So I'm not going to go into nitty gritty details of what I'm doing over here. But basically, I'm telling my WMI to create a watchman for me, which actually looks for if I create a file in a particular folder. If that file is being created, I want WMI to execute this DLL. Uh, which is nothing but a um, um, interpreter session, DLL. Um, so yeah. So there we go. By the way, this is ICE. If you are wondering about this interface, um, I do a lot of my PowerShell scripting using this. Uh, it's awesome. Okay, so 
So what I just did is I created my watchman and I'm now going to my test folder where I'm going to create a file and WMI is watching that folder for the creation of file. So Yeah. All right. So we're going to go back to Sputnik, which is uh, listening for a connection. So there you go. Um, you got a connection back from our system. Um, get UID. Okay. So hold on, hold on, hold on, Sputnik. Okay. Um, so another thing I wanted to highlight it over here is so the shell that you get back, it's actually having uh, system level privileges. So, so if you have system level privileges, you can pretty much do whatever you want on the system. Uh, so just to let you know, this is not fake. I ran the sysinfo, which tells you that this is my Windows 2016 box. All right. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go back. Any questions? Yes, sir. I like my annotation to use WMI to try and gather information on boxes. We had no luck with it. It was very slow trying to do stuff. But my question is, is there any real use for all these power in WMI other than just sitting there to be waiting to be exploited? Is there any real use for all this power? Yes, yes. You can do a lot of system administration stuff at WMI. No, no, but all these uh, if you took it away, would Windows fall down? You say if you turn it off so you don't so it's not there. So no, you can't You can't do that, but it's enabled and it's there to be to be abused. A lot of system tools, a lot of tools actually use WMI. So um, Windows itself also uses WMI, yeah. so if you turn it off you might break a lot of break stuff. a lot of things too. So I did give this bad advice to somebody, um, and it didn't end well. I told them to disable. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not the only one. I told them to disable WMI, and they had a tool which was I don't know what the tool was, but their tool stopped working. So eventually, after ten days, I get a call like, "Why did you told us to turn off WMI? We have this tool which was using that." So, yeah. Any other questions? Comments? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, what are the kinds of measures for wireless, uh, registry, wireless buses? I'm sorry, what? Registry, for yeah, wireless buses. How many measures? For that? <laughs> well, um, have a good antivirus solution in place. Teach your users not to click on content which they should not be doing. Um, you can you can also you can also um, use a file integrity monitoring solution to actually look for changes in your registry. So, if you want to do something right now, I would say that if you can create something which keeps an eye on the run key, the run once key, and yeah, look for any changes to those two keys because malware are known to exploit those two keys. Um, how you can do it is use WMI. It can do that for you. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know if any tools that you use in it, so you do anomaly detection system or something. Well, uh, I, I am not going to talk about any vendors in this presentation, but there have been, there are use cases out there which which does what you're telling, but I, I personally don't know. Um, but yes, um, any other question? Well, I just want to say, like, don't you like to be used for real-time event monitoring yeah. and alerting your SOC and NOC and build yeah. right into it specifically? I mean, it's a phenomenal tool for operational visibility and situational awareness of what's going on within your landscape, yeah. and even when it's different groups and tools as well. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So just don't think about it as malicious. WMI is amazing. And with PowerShell, yeah. it is very easy to actually use WMI now. 
Any other questions? Comments? Okay.